she was a Catholic writer. She was in uh, correspondence with many of the famous Catholic theologians of that day, not only in the United States, but in Europe. Um, she had a particular kind of metaphor for Catholicism, and it was, guess what? Protestantism, and especially Pentecostalism. She only has two Catholics in all of her work. She has two priests, and there is one of them is kind of doddering, and he's kind of out of touch, and the other one is, is kind of oily and manipulative. So it's not that she portrays the Catholics in any kind of great, um, particular great light. In fact, she was moving towards uh, a metaphor that really ensconced a lot of the Desert Fathers kind of religion, um, the asceticism, the concentration on suffering. She believed that grace entered uh, a person's life in a kind of peculiar way through violence. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I think about grace, I, I picture, perhaps in literature, I picture Jonathan Edwards kneeling in the forest, a light coming down as God offers him grace. No, that's not what she thought. She thought we had to be reduced to suffering, and if it came through violence, she said violence is a particularly good awakener, then so be it. We would be awakened through our suffering until we realized that there was only one way out of our suffering, and that was to reach for God. Because what most people do, and this was her biggest complaint, what most people do is they soothe their existential free-floating anxiety, their desire for God, in the secular world. They choose status, property, money, any kind of materialism, the secular world, she said, is taking God's place. And this was her big issue. But it doesn't come because people are uh, into religiosity or just talking the talk, but they need to walk the walk. And if they are reduced to this quivering mass of frightened ectoplasm, walking around totally egoistic and egotistic, they are aching for a breaking, as my parents used to say. They're walking along thinking they have saved themselves through uh, their status especially. Status is a big deal with a lot of her characters. Or through owning property or money. Even if the status was long ago status, it's still to them a big deal. And this is the way they soothe their fears of death is by grabbing a hold of the secular world. She says that is what's wrong with the world today. She took a dim view of the world. If you read enough of her stuff, you can get very depressed. Uh, I'm going to go through a lot of the things. I first wanted to talk a little bit about her, her um, bio. You can go ahead. Uh, so she was born in Savannah, Georgia. Um, to Edward Francis O'Connor, he was a real estate agent, and he wanted to be a writer too. He wanted to be a writer, especially, and but he did not uh, was not able to do so. Not only because he was busy taking care of his family, working very hard, but he also had progressive lupus as well, and he died when she was 15. She was born across the street from a Catholic church. She went to mass practically every day of her life. Um, uh, you can go ahead. So this is the, her father's grave, and, and lupus is this degenerative disease attacking the bones and immune in, in, <coughs> system of the body. Um, her childhood home in Savannah, across from the Catholic Church. And she critiqued her childhood, but I love her. She wrote on Alice's Adventures in, Wo in Wonderland. Awful, I wouldn't read this book. Can you just see her writing that with her color praying? Um, Georgina finds herself. This is the worst book I ever read, next to Pinocchio. <laughs> so she was a critic at a young age, and then she liked little men, though. So did I. Uh, I remember not liking uh, little women. So this, she moved to Milledgeville to this farm called Andalusia. This was a plantation that her mother inherited from her brother, raised chickens and peacocks. She went to a laboratory school that was associated with Georgia State College for Women. Then at 15, after her father's death, she decides, decides to stay in Milledgeville, and she goes to, into a three-year accelerated program. She was a social science major, which I always surprised. Every time I read, I know that intellectually, but it's hard for me to accept that emotion. She took a bit of English major. She had a number of English majors. 
uh, class, our English classes. Her, her friends remember her shy, gifted, sly humor, disdain for mediocrity, and attacks on affectation and triviality. She, she uh, drew cartoons and had them published in the, uh, her, that's okay, and had them published in the uh, college journal. And so some of them have been collected. So she got all this, she got a scholarship uh, and, and from, at the uh, State University of Iowa. Um, she started off one way, but then she entered in the master's program for creative writing. I don't even know if you know about Iowa, it's a very famous writer's school that many of our famous writers have gone to. And she just astounded people there. She'd read her stories in class, and she has a very thick southern accent. In fact, when she came for her interview to enter the, the school, uh, the Fitzgerald uh, could not understand her. And so he, when she said, when he, she said her, her little spiel, and he said, well, could you, would you write that down? I don't understand you. And she said, my name is Mary Flannery O'Connor, and I wish to attend writing school. But he, she, he couldn't understand him because her Georgia accent was so thick. Um, so she moved in with the Fitzgeralds in Connecticut. And they were staunch Catholics as well. They named her uh, uh, as a grandchild, as a godmother of one of their children, but she could never remember the child's name. But it was in 1950 that was, she was stricken with lupus. She had to move back to her mother's farm. The Fitzgeralds broke it to her. They kept it for, from her as long as they could, and then they finally broke it to her. So she had a, a brief fling with a young, handsome college textbook salesman named Frank Lodger. And he, uh, he was from Sweden, and he, they had one kiss, and he said it was like kissing a dead person. Probably by then the lupus had done a, so a number on her muscles, so that was probably part of it. But anything that any of her uh, short stories or her, her two novels, there's very little mention of sex. There's one rape in it, and it occurs so subtly you almost miss it. And, uh, but she just had no experience with that. So, uh, 64, sorry. Uh, so she suffered from lupus, same disease as her father. She was rushed in a, uh, to Baldwin County Hospital and then she just went into a coma and she succumbed to his kidney failure shortly after midnight, August 3rd. So this is a, a little bit about her religion. Um, she attended daily mass throughout her entire life. She remained true to her Catholic faith. Uh, her profound religious convictions were shown in these letters. A Habit of Beings, her letters in 1979. And then also uh, she had a, a, an award given by the Christian Century Magazine as one of the most influential, influential religious books of the century. Um, she focuses on ideas of grace, redemption, evil, love, transcendence, and apocalyptic power. That sounds like a mouthful. I tell my students, if you analyze one plot, you have all the rest of her plots. They called her kind of a one-trick pony sometimes. She had the same plots. But really, each one of her plots were, were based on the idea that you suffered and you got redemption, and or most of her characters did, not all of them. And so it, it was, but it was all, always a different setting, always a different, different kind of family. There were recurring kinds of characters. But all of her characters were so unique and refreshing that I think we can forgive her that one thing. Almost all her characters in her writing are Protestant. Um, so the, her, her connection, she said, I write in order to know what I believe. And so she wrote these short stories, and, and that was her search for God after she got a written, which is a little quick, this is what I believe. Um, Peacock, someone asked about that. In Christian art, she appears as a symbol of immorality and the incorruptible soul. She said she was attracted to the bird by instincts, and she sent feathers to correspond. Her writing. She's most known for a short story, but she had two novels, Wise Blood and The Violent Buried Away. I don't know which one's more depressing. Uh, I think probably Wise Blood. But she was a talented cartoon uh, uh, artist, and some of her cartoons can still be found around the college campus in uh, Georgia. Uh, so this is some of her cartoons. You think teachers are necessary? <laughs> no. Okay, so Wise Blood, this was received uh, with mixed reviews. Wise Blood is that intelligence in someone's instinctual blood 
that makes one want to draw towards God. So she believed that uh, the whole person was built of spirituality and a body, and they both had to be in harmony. And if one was focused on just the, the body, then and at the expense of the spirit, then horrible things could happen. If one was still it was totally spiritual, then it, it could be that uh, the, the spiritual seeking would be a little twisted. Okay. Uh, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say a little bit. She was a self-proclaimed Catholic, uh, but they, her, at that time the writings were not popular with the Catholics. Her fans say that in addition to her short career in life, she wasn't as popular because she answered, asked the hard questions about life. Um, she lived with this, uh, Robert Sally Fitzgerald, as I said, and she, st she really remained great uh, friends with her. And if you want to read uh, some of her uh, connection with Sally Fitzgerald, she, she, Sally collected them in one book called The Habit of Being. Her style, there's a unique spin on everything. She made frequent use of shock tactics, violence and grotesque situations and characters. To the hard of hearing, Christian writers shout. And for the almost blind, they draw large and startling figures. So you can almost say, she used hyperbole, uh, she, and it's almost a satirical exaggeration. And I used to read these things, and then, hopefully in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, people weren't this awful and depraved. But I think they were exaggerated for the benefit of those she thought were lost. Um, she's misunderstood by many. Even now, uh, there was a great insurgence in her writing, and even now, some of the latest uh, pronouncements about her writing are a little critical. Uh, she wrote all the way up until her death, and uh, she's now recognized as one of the most incredible female writers of all time. When you think about it, she's, she's unprecedented. She's a woman, a Catholic, a devout Catholic woman. Uh, she's a Southerner, and she's one of the most proclaimed writers in the, acclaimed writers in the world. So uh, that's pretty pretty unique. A story is a way to say something that can't be said any other way, and it takes every word in the story to say what the meaning is. That's a quote I love because so many people. What's fiction for anyway? <laughs> Um, so this is all of her awards. I'll let you admire them for a few minutes. I won't read them all. Okay. The truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Her short life was full of accomplishment. Civil rights movement, she's been criticized for not throwing herself entirely into civil rights. She had lupus. So I, I don't think that Probably she could have thrown herself. I don't think she could have marched from <laughs> thrown herself into marches. She had an, an uh, opportunity to have um, James Baldwin into her home, and she refused because she's afraid that he would upset the, the neighbors. So that's been she's been uh, she's been criticized for that. Um, but the religious, she's her complaint was that. Catholicism seemed to have become moribund uh, with the great churches, and it, does, it didn't see it didn't seem like it ceased to grow or to change. Whereas Protestantism was always ter in turmoil and in a flow and a flux, and she so she was drawn to that that the the Protestants, especially the Pentecostals, seemed to be more questioning and more. Um, dedicated to a spiritual advancement than the, maybe the self-satisfied uh, Catholic, even though she was not Catholic. Okay. So um, that was her childhood home in Andalusia, and, uh, and that was the uh, current to today. Wise blood, that, as I said, that was the one that depresses me the most. It is about a preacher who starts a church and he is, it's a church without Christ because he's questioning, he's a, he's a veteran, and he's questioning uh, Christ and Christ's teachings. 
Now, that sounds like anti-Christian, but actually he's the only one in the book that is in search of some kind of spiritual revelation. All the rest of people are, are, are hung up on money, sensuous desires, gambling, drink, and he's the only one, even though he has a kind of a weird way of showing, who's really searching for, for spiritual answers. And he does these weird things, like he puts gravel in his shoes, and he, put, he wraps his chest with barbed wire, and he thinks, he, because he, she thought suffering was a unique way to bring someone close to God. You can kind of see, she's writing all this stuff while she's suffering from lupus. So there may be a parallel there. Okay, I think that's the last one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so um, she had two techniques. One was the use of symbolism. In, in many ways, it was heavy-handed Catholic symbolism, but that's okay because she lightened it up with humor. She does the one thing that I love in any writer, and that she takes a tragedy and that she has humorous touches to it. And so I can be reading about murder, murderers, and then there's something about it that kind of makes me smile or laugh. And I don't know how she does it. Uh, so she never really apologized for that. But she has a brilliant use of humor, better than Seinfeld. Uh, she, she doesn't mind uh, having her uh, main characters fall on their faces, uh, become uh, just reduced to uh, just nothing, as long as um, they reach or have, a, uh, I guess, a, a moment when they could reach for salvation at the end. There's a, a funny a story called, or not funny, but there is a story with some humorous twists in it called Revelation. And there's a lower class woman uh, in the, with, that the main character calls White Trash. She's sitting in this um, doctor's waiting room with um, the narrator of the story, Ruby, Ruby Turpin. And uh, the the white trash lady, as that's what she calls her, exclaims that she has purchased some jewelry with trading stamps, jewelry with trading stamps, and Ruby Turpin, she's the story's protagonist and the narrator, she quips to herself, ought to have got you a wash rag and some soap. And the life you saved may be your own, which is to me very depressing as well, and we, we don't have anyone who's redeemed at the end. Uh, Mr. Shifflett, he's a huckster and a con artist, he's out to steal an automobile from this ignorant but sly country lady and uh, she, he tells him, she tells him, I, he tells her, I will work and around your farm if you let me sleep in your car. He was really out to get that car for her. And he, he's, he tries to appeal to her Christian side by saying, the monks of old slept in their coffins. And she says, uh, they, wasn't, they weren't as advanced as we were. <laughs> There's the second element though that contributes to her her vision is her use of the grotesque. And these are exaggerated, both physical and spiritual. So some of the people have missing appendages, uh, they, they have uh, ugly demeanors, and they also, she also depicts uh, some characters with, with twisted, grotesque souls. So anything that's missing uh, her Catholic dogma and that doesn't adhere to the carousels of the church, she decreed as of one of the, and she didn't use the word grotesque. In fact, that was came, came later with critics. But I think she called them, she had another name for them, uh, uh, distorted real reality is what she called it. But Mr. Shifford is, he has, he's a, missing an arm, and this kind of symbolizes his own spiritual lack. And uh, there's another story in Good Country People, Holga is missing a leg. She's also a, prof a, a professor of philosophy, a PhD. She's an avowed atheist. A lot of her intellectuals don't come off really in a real good light in her stories. Uh, atheists, scientists, PhDs, teachers, professors, they, they have the book learning, she says, but they don't have the spiritual dimension. So a lot of times they have to be reduced to um, having the vicissitudes of life confront them and, and realize they can only figure out one way out and that's with uh, reaching for God. She says this, whenever I'm asked why Southern writers particularly have a penchant for writing about freaks, I say it is because we are still able to recognize one. 
to be able to recognize a freak, you have to have some conception of the whole man. And in the South, the general conception of man is still in the main theological. So you could interpret this as, as, as a way of looking at humans as a, a, a complete human is a person in its entirety, both spiritual and physical. And if the spirituality is missing, then it might as well be missing an arm or a leg. Uh, Holga in uh, Good Country People, she may have a doctorate degree, she may be a genius in the field of philosophy, but her rejection of Christian doctrine, which is symbolized by this lack of her, her actually uh, she has a wooden leg, leaves her vulnerable to the machinations of this Bible uh, salesman who comes along, is way ahead of her, because she thinks he's innocent, she's going to corrupt him, she's going to seduce him, and instead he ends up stealing her leg and reducing her to this vulnerable person. He, she's up in the hayloft, she can't get down, so she's going to have to call for help, and, and so you can almost hear your O'Connor saying, well, you ain't so high and mighty now, are you? Because she's going to have to call for help and somehow make, get out of that situation. And for help um, you call on God. Sorry? And for help you call on God. Yeah. Exactly. And then Mr. Schiff, that I mentioned him in the line you say may be your own, uh, he has an absence of basic human dignity trying to manipulate this old woman, and he, she's got a daughter who's a deaf mute, and I think also mentally challenged as well, and he is just totally uh, uh, depraved. His deformed arm makes his exterior display of this spiritual absence, and he finally seems to ascertain for himself if the story is closed. And all, the reader has all along sensed that Schiff is with his spiritual disability far more handicapped than Lucy May, Lucy Nell, who is the the um, the child. She she has the mentality of a child. She's really about thirty. Her mother says she's fifteen or sixteen, but she's really about thirty. But since her face is so bland and smooth. Uh, and she's very beautiful. She has long blonde hair, and she looks as, like an angel, as somebody pointed out. So this use that she does is not just for um, ornamentation or exportation. And really the symbolism works a lot harder for, uh, to lay bare spiritual lack. It reveals something in her work that we can only call it so social commentary, but I think She's probably rolling over a grave right now to hear me say that she didn't see her work as any kind of social commentary. She was never a fan of sociology, so I'm sure she balked at that. But nevertheless, if you look at her, do close readings of all her work, you see a special criticism of American society after World War II. So back to Wise Blood, that was her first novel and published book, and it's in this large southern city. If you want to see the movie, it's on YouTube. If you want to be depressed, it's on YouTube. Uh, and this veteran returns from the war. Uh, he's, it's this horrible city that's dark and is full of hucksters and con artists, uh, aimless youth, men and women, conniving preachers, prostitutes. It's really a horrible place. No one there has any kind of um, modicum of, 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 of an essence of any kind of spirituality. And they have to have some kind of substitute, money or casual sex. So Hazel, Hayes, comes to this town. Um, we don't know what it is, Birmingham, Nashville, who knows, Atlanta. He doesn't come to convert the sinners to Orthodox Christianity, but he wants to emphasize the non-existence of Christ and the lie of redemption. This is one of her themes, too, in which she has her, a lot of times, really misfit characters really searching and, and worrying about Christ, did he exist or not? We have the misfit in another story, um, and a good man's hard to find. And he, he's a murderer, and he's searching for Christ in, in his own way because he looks at Christians and, see how, and sees how they drop the ball. They're not really Christians, and he takes that as evidence that Christ didn't exist. So these still, if you look at all the characters surrounding these misfits, then they are the ones searching and questioning and asking. At least Hayes knows, and this is the way uh, O'Connor put it, he's bothered by Christ. <laughs> she says, this notion of Christ, and then as the novel proceeds, <coughs> he gets <coughs> equally uh, fascinated with this other itinerant preacher 
turns out to be he's a phony. By the book's end, he's imitated the suffering. But he's not the only character in there with the potential for spiritual wholeness. Others, and there's a supposedly blind street preacher. He's a phony. Uh, he wants to make money from Mo Moat's Church Without Christ and have some sense of grace. But everybody's just too bound up in ego and this rapacious desire for money. A third character, Enoch Emery, you kind of think, well, maybe he's the only good character in there. He's got potential, but he's... I think he's more hungry for human approval and love than he is for any kind of spiritual um, um, redemption. So um, these people are walking around in this town. They're wearing Virgin Mary ties. They're selling plastic uh, crucifixes with uh, Jesus on them. Uh, they're hawking prayer claws. And we get this final image at the end of, of this um, Finding most acquiesces to the ghost of Christ that has been following him. In fact, she herself called her characters Christ haunted. And there's a wonderful book, I think it's by Souza, and he writes, Flannery O'Connor's Christ Haunted South. It's very good. Because all these characters who were so evil and bad, it seems as though they either are catalysts for somebody else to be saved almost Christ figures, or either they themselves are haunted by Christ and eventually uh, experience redemption. There's so much in her tendency to, to depict this abandonment and, and disparagement and despair, and, there, and, and it's just can be very depressing, but there's always in every story, no matter what the ending is, there's this possibility for Christian redemption. So that floats around in it. The Displaced Person, one of my favorite stories, it's not anthologized much. Um, it's the final story in her collection that man is hard to find. And we have Mrs. McIntyre. She's inherited this uh, farm from her husband. She's trying to run it by herself. Uh, she has some uh, poor black and white sheer croppers. And she finally allows, uh, because it's written about the time the displaced person immigrants were, were coming uh, to, the, uh, to North America or to the United States. And in the wake of the Second World War, a Roman Catholic priest talks her into getting a displaced person to work on her farm. Well, he turns out to be a fantastic worker. He works from sunup to sundown. He knows how to uh, take care of a tractor. He can fix tractors. He doesn't leave the tractor sitting out in the weather in the middle of the field. He drives it home at night and parks it in the barn like he should. And she is so thrilled with this. In fact, what does she say about this immigrant? I am saved, she says. That man is my salvation. Now, we sometimes say things like that, right? We need to write a word. Well, I'm saved. You've, been, you've taken me to work. But to O'Connor, that was a little bit different because Mrs. McIntyre indicates those people who were saved by material items because this immigrant lined her pocket. And this immigrant kept things going on the farm so she could re, re, uh, ha, uh, increase her profits. Uh, she then was, what is she placing her faith in? Industry? She's placing it in, in thriftiness, machinery, and one man. Not Christ. So, not God. And all of her characters make this similar mistake. So, we have this woman. She's disillusioned by the end. Because what happens is this immigrant is determined to bring his young cousin over, a woman, and by, and by marrying him to one of the black workers. And Mrs. McIntyre has a hissy fit over that. And, and so what at the end is just the most horrifying thing you can possibly think of. There's an accidental death in which one of the workers, Mr. Schiff, Mr. what's his name? I forgot it. He has a name. Uh, anyway, another one of her workers has, is on the big tractor. He sets parks it on a hill. The bottom of the hill is the immigrant working on the little tractor with his legs sticking out. Well, he doesn't put it in any kind of gear that's going to hold it on that hill. And it starts rolling down. And Mrs. McIntyre could have yelled. But she didn't. She didn't yell. She could have yelled to him, get out of the way, but she didn't. So she was complicit in his death. She ends up in a horrible state. Her, uh, all the workers leave because she's just a blithering, uh, guilt, guilty mess. She ends up with one person taking care of the whole farm falling apart and this Catholic priest coming over and preaching dogma to her. Um, so she has 
really no choice but to listen to the lectures at the end of her life. There's another, the river in which a boy, uh, a little boy is neglected by a father and his father and mother. Uh, they are alcoholics, they're into socializing, they hire this country woman who's very religious to come take care of him. She comes and picks him up for the day, proselytizes to him. He learns that the word Jesus Christ is not a curse word, like he had learned at home. And so uh, he begins to really get into the idea of redemption and salvation. He's baptized in the river, but he, wa he wants to go back and find that feeling he obtained in the river by being baptized, so he ends up drowned. Uh, he's looking for this literal uh, kingdom of God. Um, this faithfulness, this transference of, of faith to industry and intellect and science, sex, gross natural product, whatever, is it, very well illustrated, we think, of society today. Uh, and there are maybe a few writers who's trying to carry on with some of the, I, I guess, compassionate Christian values, but well, not many. Jack Maritain says that only a Christian can be a good novelist. He's not being bigoted or even completely serious for that matter. What he means is that while a writer may not possess the hardcore religious convictions of Flannery O'Connor, he should at least have some sense of man's spirituality in order to treat his characters in the entirety. So I guess he should have said human spirituality. So O'Connor's fiction offers some ideas of what happens when the safeguards of, of religion are taken off. One of my favorite stories to teach is a good man is hard to find. This grandmother who invites herself along with her son and his family to Florida, dressed up in her finest clothes just in case she has an accident on the road, then whoever picks up the body will realize that she's a lady and a person of value. Pride. This was the worst thing that you could possibly have uh, for a character is to have this pride and this kind of allegiance to your own self. The ego. Pride. Get rid of the ego and pride and then perhaps you can have some kind of spiritual life. But the grandmother's pride ultimately can't save her. She does, she hides this cat in a vallis because her son doesn't want the cat along. The cat jumps out in this rural area uh, because she kicks it over because she realizes she has begged him to take her to this plantation that she knew in when she was a, a child, but she realizes she's in the wrong state. And she gets upset, kicks the bell, so the cat jumps up, jumps on a baby's head, he turns the car over and falls into the ravine. And what happens, these serial killers come out of the woods, they're in the car, hearse like auto that drives down and, and sees them and kills all the whole family. Oh, to a con, there was no small sins. So this pride that the grandmother had, she, she uh, was obedient to it. She couldn't admit to her son, we're on the wrong road. That would have saved him. So you can see, no small sin. Yeah, it can, it can be, pride can be like a snowball going downhill and it gathers more and more meaning and more and more power until there's five people dead in this rural area. But this misfit, how am I doing with time? Um, you're good. Okay, I'm almost through. So uh, he's, he's taken the whole family off. There's a couple, and the, fa the, the son and the, her uh, daughter-in-law, two children, and a baby and takes him off in the woods and then they, the misfit and the grandmother has this pretty deep theological conversation and the grandma's begging for her lies. My students get so upset with the grandma, they don't believe she got saved in the end, but she does. Um, and she's begging for her life any way she can. I know you're a good man, she says. She's trying to appeal to and all the time her family's being, you can hear the shots in the forest. And so my, my students have no sympathy with her at all. But it comes out okay because she does get to this uh, situation or this passage when she loses all hope in her own powers to persuade and she just lets go and she sees the misfit as her own child. And if I may, I'll just read a tiny bit with it. There was a piercing scream from the woods followed closely by a pistol report. Does it seem right to you, lady, that one is punished a heap and another ain't punished at all? Jesus, the old lady cried, you've got good blood. I know you wouldn't shoot a lady. I know you come from nice people. Pray, Jesus, you ought not shoot a lady. I'll give you all the money I've got. Lady, the misfit said, looking beyond her far into the woods, there never was a body that gave the undertaker a tip. 
There were two more pistol shots, and the grandmother raised her hand, head like a parched old turkey hen crying for water and called for her son. Baby boy, baby boy, as if her heart would break. Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he shouldn't have done that. He followed everything off balance. If he did what he said, then there's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, there's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness, he said, and his voice had become almost a snarl. Maybe he didn't raise the dead, the old lady mumbled, not knowing what she was saying and feeling so dizzy that she sank down to the ditch with her legs twisted under her. That may, that may, may sound like the opposite of her approaching salvation, but for the first time she is thinking about religion. Is it true or is it not? She's like Thomas. This is kind of a Thomas saying passage in which she's finally saying something authentic about religions instead of just platitudes. I wasn't there. So I can't say you didn't, the misfit said. I wish I had been there, he said, hitting the ground with his fist. It's all right. I wasn't there. It ain't right that I wasn't there because if I had been there, I would have known. Listen, lady, he said in a high voice. If I had been there, I would have known I wouldn't be like I am now. His voice seemed about to crack and his grandmother's head clear, and the grandmother's head cleared for an instant. She saw the man's face twisted close to her, home, her own as if he, was going to cry, her, he were going to cry and she murmured, why you're one of my babies, you're one of my own children. So she's doing the one thing I said, love your enemies, right? She's loving someone who's about to kill her. My students don't, don't, don't approve of that. They, they don't see that. Uh, they, they still hold her, her liable. So she reaches out and touches them on the shoulder. And this is why I think she reached salvation, because it so upset the misfit. He said that Christians don't act like Christians. So therefore, there's only one thing to do, and that's meanness. If, Christian, if Christ were really true, then all the Christians two, for, for 2,000 years would have been acting like Christians. But since they don't, then he has the perfect right to act with meanness. But once she loves him, he's seen for the first time a Christian acting like a Christian, loving him. And he can't stand it. It's completely opposite of his philosophy. He wants an excuse to kill and be mean, then she's completely destroyed it. The misfit sprang back as if a snake had bitten him and shot her three times through the chest. Then he put his gun down on the ground and took off his glasses and began to clean them. He's, to me, that's very symbolic. He's cleaning his glasses because he can't quite believe his own eyes. This is someone who's acting like a Christian. That's not in my philosophy. Hiram and Bobby Lee, that's his cohorts, returned from the woods and stood over the ditch looking down at the grandmother who's half sat and half lay in a puddle of blood with her legs crossed under her like a child's and her face smiling up at a cloud of the sky. So this is another hint to me she was, uh, he, she was saved because she's like a child looking up to heaven and she's smiling. Without his glasses, the misfit's eyes were red and pale and defenseless looking. Take her off and throw her where you saw the others, he said, picking up the cat that was rubbing itself against his leg. She was a talker, wasn't she, Bobby Lee said, sliding down the ditch with a yo. She would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. Some fun, Bobby Lee said. Shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said. It's no real pleasure in life. So this, she, the grass completely destroyed his philosophy. He realizes it doesn't have a leg to stand on. There's one Christian in the world. He just killed her. And then when she says this, he says this, she would have been a good woman. If there had been someone, and I can see you nodding, you know what that means, don't you? I have to explain it to my students. O'Connor would have been perfectly happy with a, a serial killer being saved on the way to the electric chair. She, most of us cynically would look at that and say, oh, well, of course, there are no atheists in foxholes. But she was fine with atheists in foxholes converting, and she would have been fine with any murderer on the way to the electric chair who would have seen God and, and been saved. So I just want to give some time to you for um, some questions, if you had any. Hope it wasn't too gory. <laughs>